Hello, this is Chef Michael, and we're going to be doing an extended video series on holiday cooking. We're going to make a variety of items, including our goose. And we're going to be doing a cornbread stuffing. Uh, most of what we're cooking will be uh, semi-local, either coming from our garden, our friend Navi who forages, and uh, the farmer's market. For this cornbread stuffing, I made cornbread recently, uh, yesterday. Uh, we've tried a little bit, <clears throat> made sure it works. This is um, using cornmeal from Shadyside Farm, uh, which does organic cornmeal, and they have an open pollinated stone ground cornmeal. Uh, not only is it some of the best tasting cornmeal and grits in the United States, they happen to be in our local farmer's market, so we have direct access to them. Uh, you can get them on their website, Shadyside Farm, if you have interest. This cornbread has, um, it's made with butter, it's got a little bit of white flour, a little bit of whole wheat flour. It's got both coarse grain and fine grain cornmeal. Uh, it's got just a little bit of sugar. Pretty flexible, you can change around those ingredients a little bit. All we're gonna do is cut up pieces and cube it up and we'll wet that as part of our stuffing. Today what we're doing is we're just preparing all the other ingredients that will go in it because uh, this could all be done in the morning, uh, but we're gonna do it a day ahead of time so that we can pick it up and finish it quicker uh, during the day. So I am going to add into it chanterelles. This is a chicken mushroom which is an absolutely huge leak so I grabbed that. Some carrots and celery. Got some local baby garlic. I'm going to actually roast a small amount of this for some other stuff. So this is going to be roasted. So Greenside Farms, uh, one of their local red varieties. It's a nice crisp acidic. We're going to put a little pork in there. You don't have to but this is pancetta that I made. I've got a little bit of local pork sausage that I made. We got chestnuts, lots of chestnuts around here. So these were roasted on top of our fireplace this morning. They're gonna be chopped up and put in the stuffing. So we're gonna have a real nice savory stuffing. Our traditional mirepoix, onion, celery, carrots, uh, leeks, maybe a touch of garlic. Then we're gonna add the mushrooms for some earthiness. Um, the chestnuts are a little bit earthy and sweet. The apples are sweet. The pork is porky. None of it's smoked. And that will be the base. Tomorrow, uh, we'll add in some fresh thyme, some fresh parsley. We'll add in a few eggs, and I'll look at it either add a little, a little chicken stock uh, to help bring it all together. I'll see how wet it is. When I make a stuffing, I typically want to cook a lot of the items. A couple of reasons. One is that items that aren't cooked frequently don't fully cook out. So they're gonna be texturally tough or they won't develop full flavor. And so if I really wanna get the best flavors out of it, I want these vegetables to sweat in some fat. Uh, I'll probably use a little olive oil and butter. We'll cook down the pork, same reason, get the flavor out, also get a uh, good texture on it. And of course, um, stuffings are concerned that the things are fully cooked. So uh, we're gonna have eggs and dairy and everything else. They'll get fully cooked, but if there's any concern about things you're putting in it, um, it's always better to start with um, pre-cooking some of these items. I don't use a lot of things other than fresh herbs and um, salt and pepper. We don't really need them when you're cooking with great quality products. Uh, the flavor's already there. Uh, just for a leak, so you know, a lot of this uh, hard leak is, this is good for stock, but it can't even make your stock green. Uh, so I take off the top part. So what we do is we open it halfway, like this, or all the way, leave the root in, and we can thumb through it. Actually, it's not that dirty. Sometimes you'll see them really dirty. Uh, all I do now is I rinse it thoroughly. It's real simple, just open it like a book. Get the dirt out. Uh, for leeks, now I can cut the ends off. As far as cutting up leeks, when they're big like this, best thing to do is take about half of it out, because now you can smash it down. And it's a lot easier once it slip on you and you can get it into a decent decent rough medium dice. A little smaller dice than the other stuff because it's harder. I want it to cook pretty evenly. So this is between a small and a medium dice because it's close to a small dice, just rough. Celery, same thing. I like to cut it in the middle just so the Sides fall flat, and then I'm going to do a rough, rough dice on it. So European cuisine is traditionally underpinned with the flavors of mirepoix, the onion, garlic. I'm sorry, the onion, onion, celery, and carrots. In this case, I'm using two types of onions. 
I'm using the leeks and the white onions. It's usually about 50% onion to about 25% carrot, 25% celery. Uh, those ratios can change. You can use parsnips if you want uh, less color. You can use celery root if you want a really white stock. Uh, slightly different flavors. But that flavor of mirepoix is both subtle and strong and when it's simmered or roasted or caramelized develops very distinguished flavors and is the background of most of our soup sauces and stuffing. So we try and put them into as many items as possible. So we're going to sweat this down. I'm going to use some unsalted butter and some olive oil. Uh, adding some butter in, again, not necessary, uh, but butter has unique flavors and when you sweat mirepoix, uh, I just have the feeling that butter does a nicer job. You just get a better flavor. Uh, while that's getting ready, I am going to prepare a little bit of the pork. We're probably going to stick it in this cast iron back here. We're going to do the same thing. We're just going to render it down. So this is pancetta. Pancetta is Italian bacon. It is cured, however it is not smoked. This was not brined, it was rubbed, and then it was hung. All right, so we're just gonna sweat this stuff. So all I wanna do is develop flavor, tenderize it. I don't wanna really develop much color, not important on this. I'm gonna start this out separate of the vegetables. I could have started this first and then added the fat. Uh, the vegetables into some of this fat, but this is just uh, Italian sausage that I made. It's been frozen. I cased it, but I'm taking it right out of the casing. So these mushrooms, I can either rough cut them up for stuffing. The other thing I can do, I can just pull them apart, and they'll you're gonna just saute them and not put them in a stuffing. They'll pull apart nicely. So this is almost done. I think I will add a little salt and pepper to it just to get it going. Soften, it's translucent. I've got nice flavors coming out of the out of the leeks. Soften the carrots a little bit. Get the back of your knife. Angle. Usually, if you hit away, it all falls apart. When you lightly smash it, it will usually yield the skin pretty easily. Don't want to make just bacos because uh, well, it's, you can burn it, and it's, at some point you start losing them. some of the good flavors. All right, so that's probably about good enough to eat right there. So these mushrooms are going to absorb quite a bit of oil. So we want a smoking hot pan. Frying the sound in the back. No, we're not, not sweating it. We want the skin on so we can see what they are in the stuffing. You could peel them, but you don't need to. You don't have to cook the apples, but I'm just going to slip them in there because they're there. So this is kind of an average to medium sized chestnut. Uh, but being these are local and again, poor year, they're a little smaller. They should be um, sweet and earthy and a little, you know, soft yielding. Uh, depending on how fresh they are. Put a little parsley in. I'll use the stems possibly for the sauce and such. But this is enough stuff right here. This is almost a stuffing in itself. We haven't even added the bread. And... All right, so the next step to making a good stuffing or dressing is high quality bread. So this was that cornbread we talked about earlier. Uh, it's just to stir together cornbread. And so I'm gonna just cut pieces on it. We... So thinking about half inch or so. Uh, bread that's dried out just a little bit is actually better because it can absorb more flavors and more stuff in it. This is a lightly sweetened cornbread. This all gets dumped in here. Okay, me measuring is pretty optional. Right, I'm going to stir this up. 
Things that I would, will add to this in the morning, I'm gonna get some thyme. I will probably put about four or five eggs in there, but eggs will enrich it and help make more of a custard base and bind it. If I find it's dry, which is probably a little dry, I'll either add in some chicken stock or I'll add in a little bit of milk uh, or water or vegetable stock. I'll probably end up adding some cracked pepper, maybe a few dry spices along with the fresh thyme. You could put in dried fruit if you want to put in dried cranberries or cherries. Or... This is ready to pack into a pan and cook. Put a little white pepper in there. Be careful with white pepper. It, it's really strong. It, it jumps through flavor-wise and people notice it. Not everybody likes it. Uh, in the background, it's good. Part of the reason we season it up so much is um, starches have a lot of density, so they take a lot of seasoning, they absorb it. If you think about mashed potatoes, it can take a lot of salt. A little extra virgin olive oil. I know we put some fat in it already. There we go. So what we made yesterday, I added six eggs to it and a splash of apple cider uh, to wet it. And um, that's about it. That will bake for probably about an hour, which is the turkey or the Goose will take about another hour. Things we're going to be producing, an orange cranberry sauce, roasted sweet potatoes, both American style orange sweet potatoes, and we're also going to have some Asian white yams or white sweet potatoes in there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start by roasting our sweet potatoes. The red ones, which are the Asian sweet potatoes, and they're more of a creamy whitish color inside. And then we have the orange sweet potato skins that have a traditional orange flesh. So we're just going to rinse these off and I'm going to stick them in the oven. I'll prick them a couple of times and we're going to roast them so that they are beginning to soften, but I can peel them and not have them fall apart. got uh, about a 350, 360 degree oven. I'll check them in maybe half hour, 45 minutes. So we're a little under an hour here, 50 minutes or so. Um, I, actually, I don't want these to soften up much. I need to get them to cool down. All right, so we're back to the sweet potatoes. They've been in the fridge just Cooling off a little bit so we can handle them. So sweet potato, all we're gonna do is peel them, hand peel them, scrape them, whatever we need to do. We're probably gonna finish them with a little maple syrup, brown sugar, cinnamon sticks, the standard. And there's all these other Asian yams and sweet potatoes. Some grow really big. I've had quite a few Caribbean and Asian yams in New York uh, markets, but um, these, this is a good variety. I don't know what variety it is. I've just set up the sweet potatoes, I've got some brown sugar, some butter, and some broken up cinnamon sticks, and a little maple syrup, uh, pretty standard. So that'll go in an oven, uh, probably 30 minutes or so. I'm gonna put just a touch of ginger on the sweet potatoes. it up too much. So I got a hot oven running. I got a 500 degree oven so we're just blasting the turkey. Sweet potatoes. Quick glaze on the sweet potatoes. Very hot. Brown sugar, maple, cinnamon sticks. Touch ginger on the end. We've got the Korean or Asian sweet potato, and we got the traditional sweet potato or yam. All right, so we're just going to peel potatoes from mashed potatoes. Cut the ends off because there's the least waste there. A lot of peeling around. Take a peeler. 
top to bottom, one stroke, so you don't waste time with the really big potato. That's it. You want big enough pieces that they're not going to stretch out all over the place, but you also want them to uh, cook evenly. So cook, cutting most potatoes in half, quarter is really big potato more. Other way you can peel it. One more note about potatoes. Use russet potatoes for mashed potatoes or a highly starchy potato. An Idaho potato from Idaho uh, is uh, always your go-to for the best mashed potatoes. I have our potatoes. They've cooked for 35, 45 minutes, something like that. They're pork soft but not falling apart. Potatoes are dry. Um, just dry them out briefly. So we're gonna just puree the <coughs> potatoes in a food mill. You can use a food mill, you can use a ricer, you can do a straight out mash, that's fine. But uh, palm puree is traditionally done through a mesh. Reason is we don't want to collapse the starch, which we made nice and light and fluffy. Potatoes should stay hot. They're nice and fluffy and loose. They should be, stay hot. The milk should be hot. Some salt in. Choice white or black pepper. I use either one, but white pepper and traditional. Touch the nutmeg in there. Watch out for the white pepper and the nutmeg. They can get strong. Not everybody's used to them. All right, now you can either use a, a whisk or a spoon or a, I happen to have a masher here. Just gonna stir it together. Don't have to do much. Should be just a little thinner than an American mashed potato if you're doing a European one. Uh, it will set up on you a little bit. All right, uh, so we're gonna make some quick cranberry sauce. This is about the fastest cranberry sauce you can make. It's a raw preparation, so it's healthy. Uh, one orange. Take the top and bottom off. Open it up, make sure it's limited on the seeds. I like to cut out some of that core stuff. Get out, if it's a navel orange, get out the uh, pith and stuff at either end. So you've got, um, this is nice, it's a little thinner skinned. You get the sweetness and the bitterness of the orange. So you use the entire peel and the pith, minus some of these heavier pieces. And trying to get the seeds out is always a bonus. Pound of cranberries from the farmer's market. Um, secondary source. There are a lot of cranberries growing around here. Put the oranges in, put the cranberries in. Uh, you could use a blender on pulse. Cuisinart works better. Put in a rough pound of cranberries to one, one, maybe two oranges. One cup of sugar. So you can stir it if you want. This is a cranberry relish. It's really nice and, and fresh and relishy at the moment. It will cure um, overnight and be more of a sauce. All right, so we're gonna do some seared Brussels sprouts and plus some turnips. All right, for these, all I'm gonna do is check any, uh, any bad spots, bad leaves, trim the ends on them. If they're a little bigger, Sometimes I like to notch them, just put an X in them. I'm gonna blanch them, I'm gonna blanch them half cooked. Turnips you can peel or not peel. These are baby turnips, they, peel, they look pretty clean. I'm just gonna cut these down so they blanch pretty quickly. Just a really quick blanch, got some salt and water. A little ice water to shock them because I do want to stop the cooking so they don't want to cook. Right, let me start pulling these out. So when you blanch something, about the same amount of time as you cook it, there's usually about the right amount of time to chill it. Turnips are going to go fast. It's just softened a little to the touch. Stir in some bacon. Rendered some bacon halfway, cut some apples up. That's going to be for the roasted Brussels sprouts and turnips. Going back to the bacon, rendered out a little while ago. It's half three quarters cooked. 
going to use that fat to grease my pan. We're going to start the Brussels sprouts and turnips. So we got the blanched Brussels sprouts from yesterday. They're all in good shape. Turnips, nobody's lost any color. We've got the apples. So we're just taking this uh, little bacon fat. Brussels sprouts. As much of an even layer as possible. I try and turn a lot of them facing down. I do want to get them to steer on the downside. And set up the turnips. Pretty similar. Ran out of a little bit of bacon fat that was in there. Bacon in over the top. Pepper. The apples just had some fruity nuts. Tart. See, we've got some nice chips of browning. Add the Brussels back. And you can deglaze the pan with nice red wine vinegar, but balsamic will stay in it. This is a cherry, and that's a local cherry vinegar. What this does is add, bring some of the fond off the pan, adds some acidity, increases the fruitiness, just kind of wakes it up. All right, so this item's done. All right, next item, bonus item. So these are sun chokes, or Jerusalem artichokes. It's just got a little, you know, it's a starch root. We're gonna roast them, so that's kind of a bonus item. So, a lot of times they're peeled. Um, I tend just to look for the stem in and any tough spots, and these are in beautiful shape. I'm gonna oil them, season them, and uh, roast them in a 375, 400 degree oven. Um, sun chokes here. I was just heating a pan. I'm gonna roast those. I'll pre-roast them a little bit. This oil was just getting hot. It's extra virgin olive oil. So I'm gonna give these a quick start to the roast and then I will stick them in the oven. Just gonna get a little salt and pepper. What's in the pan? Oh, those are the sun chokes. I roasted them, but um, not extremely hot because we got other things roasting. So uh, they've softened. I'm just going to sear them down a little bit. These will break down, get a little bit soft. See how we're tasting. Some chokes. So we could herb these up or do a lot of things, but we're just going to leave with the extra virgin olive oil. So that's the. Special edition, some roasted sunchokes. Next item, these are just for some uh, quick sauteed greens. I have a variety of greens. They're looking a little limp. We got them a week ago because no, uh, no market. I'll show you how to use them a little limpy. So we got some uh, bright light Swiss chard or you know rainbow Swiss chard. We got some nice little stock matured lacinato or uh, Tuscan kale. We got some type of other run of the mill kale. Got an old leek that's been laying around, actually older than the leek we used earlier. Make it usable despite a little bit of age on it. Mostly it's dehydration we're dealing with here because they weren't well wrapped up. Let's so give this a quick chop chop now. Okay, so what you can do if you got leaves that are a little quicker cooking, a little more tender than stalks, you can just kind of Pull them either forwards or back, whichever way they like to come off. Stalks, just like celery, you can cut them straight across and dice them up really nice and fine. The only thing I can say about greens, uh, they can revive a little bit in here. They'll take on a little moisture, but it doesn't really matter. Plunge them. Actively plunge them up and down get all the sand out, and then do it in enough water that there's water below the level of the greens. While you're plunging that, all that heavy sand, that rock material, to go to the bottom and disappear into the sink. That's the whole point of cleaning them, aside from the hydration. 
going to get some roasted garlic. This is what we roasted last night. Just going to cut the heads off. Got to cut through the stem. These are little guys. Just near the top of the, the head. It's going to allow me to squeeze out the puree. It'll leave behind most of the uh, most of the rest of the uh, head. Okay, so we reheat this pan. I just rinsed it out real quick. Extra virgin olive oil. Uh, this is for the greens. So we're so we're moving towards uh, pretty smoking hot pan because we got a lot of greens. They're going to give off a lot of water. So we got those mixed greens, two types of kale, chard, uh, some leek bunches in there. We're just going to sweat them down. We're not going to cook them too much. Greens are just a little bit wet from being uh, clean last night. We could spin them, but we, uh, we left them in a colander. They're in good shape. Let's start with that. These are gonna these are gonna wilt down pretty quick. We'll add more. So we're adding the rest of the greens. So it won't get all of it out, but it'll sure get most of it out. It's the easiest way to do a roasted garlic. If this starts to run a little dry, we can sprinkle a touch of water on it. It's fine. Just touch pepper, or touch salt. Don't need much for greens. Greens need a touch of water. I turned the heat down on those. They're just finishing out. Uh, we are working with goose. Uh, this is sort of the highlight of our demo. This is our goose. This was an extra one that's not part of our guard flock. This bird's in pretty good shape. So uh, goose is a lot like preparing a duck. In fact, I would just treat it like a duck, a big duck. You can brine them. Do an overnight brine or a couple day brine. And why um, do you tuck the wings back? Well, get some out of the way. Two reasons. One, I want to uh, get a nice even browning on the breast. Uh, the other thing I want to do is create a nice resting it's almost like its own rack i'm going to put instead of a brine i'm going to put some salt on it and some pepper and just let it sit overnight and um, we're going to roast it to near well done so this is always fresh ground pepper grind in your coffee mill then put rice in your coffee mill get uh, get the pepper flavor out so you don't have pepper coffee so fresh ground pepper big big difference you get flavor it's strong use half as much but it's uh It'll give you flavor instead of just heat. So I'm just going to rub it heavily with salt. A lot of this salt is going to fall off in the cooking process, so it's going to draw moisture out for the next few hours and cause it, you know, pool in the bottom of the pan. I'm just going to cook it pretty standard. I'll probably tie it up, put some vegetables in there. I'll check and re-rub it. But right now we're heavily seasoned. I'm going to let it air dry. Just leave it in the cooler in the refrigerator overnight current status and just let it air dry and get a little bit of natural cure on it. And the goose is approaching 30 minutes and so I have it in a roasting pan. So I got some vegetable in there roasting. I have the goose at a high heat, 400 degrees, rendering down and starting to get some of the fat out of the top. There is some tin foil that's left from the turkey. I just snaked some tin foil around and, and that's a good way to create a roasting rack when you don't have a one that fits properly. So I've got some nice juices in here. I may pull the juices off and pull the mirepoix out uh, while the roast, while the turkey continues to roast. We're gonna turn the temperature down on that soon, probably 350. All right, we're checking on the goose. So I'm getting close. I'm looking a little bit at the temperature, 165 for poultry. Honestly, I am looking more at has it loosened up. Still a little tight. Take the legs off. Legs gonna fall off. That's good news. That's what we want. All right. Bones on a goose or a duck are a little tougher than a chicken, so sliding through some of these joints, it's about the same, but you may have a little less tolerance. So this, I'm gonna be even, I'm cutting it up even more. Um, smaller pieces, I just wanna 
break it up and maximize it. So I just come around, the uh, joint will release. That is an oyster, Christmas oyster. That tastes like goose. The breast is very long and shallow. This isn't like we mentioned, I don't feel like it's going to be much bigger than a very large duck breast. If you get the wishbone out, you get a straighter line taking the meat off. Breast, there we go. We get a better cut. I had a really big goose, commercial goose, quite a few years ago. I estimated probably fed six, maybe. And it was way bigger, so. Uh, playing lots of geese if you're doing a big event. Playing one for every, I don't know, three people, four people at most. Okay. We're doing a turkey also because that goose isn't going to feed very many people and some people won't eat goose. Um, so we got a 17 pound turkey, just kind of a medium sized guy, not too big. A lot of it's similar. Golly. Can't tell you how many times we had cooks leave the giblets. Cook the turkey with the baggie in the other end. So here's the tail, Pope's nose. Uh, and we got gizzard. Gizzard's been, yep, gizzard's cut open clean. Got a little bit of liver, got a heart, got a uh, neck. We will use all of these things except for the liver probably to make, uh, to roast with it and make gravy. This has been brine, this is commercial turkey. Uh, we didn't do anything that's too special on it, so it's good. Find these big fat things, get rid of those guys. This case is already brine, not worried about it. So I could trim, actually I probably will because we're not going to stuff the end of that. I can trim off a big chunk of fat, it's just going to burn up. I am going to tack the wings back into a sunbathing position. I am going to still lightly season this even though it's been brined. I would let it dry down, but we're going to leave it in the fridge to dry and form what's called a pellicle. All those brining juices and natural juices will get a little bit sticky and help attract the smoke season it. I'm going to get up about 5.30 in the morning, turn on the smoker. We've got a temperature controlled pellet smoker. So, all right, got some bay leaves. Throw a few in the cavity. And a little pepper. So we're going to smoke this for five to six hours on it. Get it fully cooked. We're going to hot smoke it. Mesquite flavored celery seed and garlic -y and I don't know, it smells good. I'm going to just let it dry out also. There's a lot to be said for brining, but then there's also a lot to be said for drying, letting things dry out and concentrate. We have a turkey that's basically ready. This was a 17 pound turkey, so not too large. This was intended to be smoked, although I got up and had it on the smoker just before six in the morning and it was smoking. Went back to bed for a couple hours and when I got up it was completely cold. It had cut out, couldn't get it relit, cleaned everything out. I think my heating probe broke. So we rushed this into the oven. Problem being I only have one oven, so had a little bit of a time crunch, space crunch. So we got it in the oven. It's actually finished because it wasn't that big. So it's not smoky, but it is a properly cooked turkey. The turkey, we're just gonna keep it here. I got it in kind of a warm area. It'll end up going in the oven for maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes at the end. Just put a little heat back on it. We're just trying to reheat and brown everything off. And I am about to pull out the turkey, which is just being browned off. So we just put a little heat on this. Still warm in the middle, but wanted to get a little exterior heat. We're gonna carve this bird up real quick. Best thing you can do is just cut the crispy skin, um, pull the leg and thigh. It should peel off pretty easily. We'll find the joint right down in there. You can actually almost pull it out. For these, we'll just leave drumsticks. Sometimes people want a drumstick, we can pull the meat off of them later. 
using our fingers because I washed my hands a moment ago. So all I'm going to do is just slice this against the grain a little bit. Best way to handle the breast is you can slice it like this or you can slice it like this, but you're eventually going to run into the bone. So if you have the opportunity to slice it in the kitchen like we're doing, what I recommend is take it off the bone completely and then we're going to slice it so we can properly cut it. It's going to follow the down and get around the wing. This is a medium sized bird, so this is a 17 pound bird. Skin's nice and crispy, so I'm going to leave that on. And I like to just cut straight down, thin slices, about a quarter inch or so. So now we got the loin, tenderloin all together, a wing. Leave a wing, and then I want to do one more thing. The, the best part of the bird is right here. It's called the oyster. It's underneath the back, and it's a little concave. And it's super tender, and it moist, moistly cooks base the whole time underneath. So flavor and texture, it's the best piece on the turkey. We have the turkey out of the pan. We also put the goose in the pan for a while. Roasted some mirepoix, onions, carrots, celery. You have parsnip in there. That's some giblets, a whole clove of garlic, whole head of garlic. And we got some nice brown bits. You want to use all this stuff. I poured off just a little bit of grease. I'm just going to deglaze the pan. So it's got it hot. Put about half a bottle of white wine in. You could use white wine, you could use cider, you could use juice, use water, use chicken stock. The key is we're taking all the brown bits off the bottom of the pan, called deglazing. The wine, aside from adding a fruity flavor, will add some acid. The acidity is useful for sauces and also for clarifying uh, stocks, but we're not really going to clarify this because it's a pan gravy. Some reduced chicken stock here, which I'll be using to extend the gravy. I'm going to make some roux for a for the gravy. So we can either start thicken it with a little cornstarch or we can make a roux 50-50 butter and flour by weight. You can melt the butter. I'll put it, probably put it in by pretty much by eye, but it should uh, look like a wet sand as it warms up. So I've done a pretty good job deglazing this. The next thing I'm going to do I can either transfer it to a smaller pan, pick it up. I think for the moment I'm just going to get that chicken stock in there. So it's a reduced chicken stock that we made. Just butter. A lot of times we use clarified butter if we're going to make a real dark brown roux, but I think it's going to be pale and lightly brown. So I got a quarter pound of butter. This is, I just put a quarter cup of flour in, we'll adjust it as needed, plug in a touch more. Quarter cup of flour is not a quarter, quarter pound. So, so roux works best by weight. This will more than thicken our gravy, so we're gonna we'll put a little bit in and we'll hold back. So this needs to cook out so it's uh, sandy. We're gonna get it lightly browned, medium brown. Watch out for the roux, it's extremely hot. It's way hotter than the boiling uh, liquid. Also be careful when you put it in. It's super heated if you got boiling liquid like I do here. So roux thickened gravy, pan gravy, should cook about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. <laughs> you want to get the floury taste out of it. With cornstarch you don't have to do that. Uh, so we are going to want to just simmer this at a low temperature. It'll finish thickening and uh, cook out that flour. To strain the sauce, I have a chinois, which is a fine mesh strainer. You can use any strainer that you wish. Use a ladle and you plunge it up and down and it creates a vacuum that will uh, remove the debris off of the chinois and let the juices fall through. Right. What we have here is the sauce a little bit fatty in it, not too much fat because it's a roux thick and we're going to bring it to a simmer. 
We're going to taste it, check the seasoning, but it should be about right. Tastes like poultry, tastes like vegetables. It's not bitter, touch of sweetness, a little bit of acidity. Salt's pretty good on it. I'm really not going to do much to it. Just let it cook out for a few minutes. Yep, well our thigh meat is tender, which is always the hard part, is yeah. getting Oh your... my gosh, that is so good. <laughs> wow. Time. Yeah, I eat ducks, I don't know, I guess that... Being in oh. restaurants, I, I get my hands on crispy duck and goose and pull, you know skin more than... Uh, but yeah, it's, it's significantly better than chicken or turkey. Skin. That is so good. It's like eating chicharron, little you know, pork cracklings, but even most, almost better, so... Yeah, I'd say better. Yeah. Your goose is cooked. Your goose is cooked. Yes.